why others couldn't have done it and why NMDC had been able to do it. NMDC had been able to do it because of three factors. One, because of resources, it had money. Second, technology. There are technologies available which requires a little bit of investment, but the technology was important. And third, intentions. One required the intention to do it. I'm coming to these things a little later, but let me hasten to add, environmental environment does not only mean green, slopey hills. It does not only mean forests. Apart from the, those inanimate objects, environment also means people who are disturbed, dislodged, displaced from their habitats when you do some sort of mining activity. Therefore, environmental protection does not always mean only protecting the green cover, only protecting the air and water. Environment also means protecting the people whose life is adversely affected by industries, more so by the mining industries which are situated in the tribal areas of the country, mostly. We have seen one thing. There is a school of thought in India which says that a person when he is dislodged from his normal habitat, who is displaced from his livelihood, in that case, the displacement is so severe, no measure can really compensate for that. I personally feel it is wrong. For every human being, there is an arch for better living. If you displace a tribal from his forests, from his small piece of land, and make him an unskilled laborer in a township, obviously he is not going to like it. But if you are bringing in qualitative changes in, in his life through healthcare, through education, through employment, then don't bother about removing him from his habitat. He will, in any case, get a much better quality of life which you would like. This we have seen. For this again, you require resources, you require technology, and you require a once again intentions. I still remember that when we decided that in addition to the mines, we will set up a steel plant, an integrated steel plant. We wanted to address many things together. The steel plant was decided to be set up in a place where 100% land belonged to tribals. I remember having gone to the tribal villages myself and shared my dream with them. I said that, look, this is the steel plant what we are trying to set up. And our intention is that unless we set up a steel plant, we cannot take care of your livelihood. I promise, right from unskilled labor to the general manager, everybody in this steel plant will belong to the local community. And I promise that before the first brick is laid, there would be polytechnics, there would be ITIs, English medium residential schools, so that the people of this place, they will get an opportunity to build their lives and ultimately they will occupy the places. We also decided to pick up some graduates from the tribal community and send them for management education so that they become the first batch of management trainees in the steel plant. When we wanted for land acquisition, only within the next three to four months, not a single person said no to it. 125 tribal people, they refused to leave the place. They said, our land is not being, not being acquired. We demand our land should also be acquired. We want to be a part of the process. And we did, did that. Today, the steel plant, within just 10 months, entire process of land acquisition com was completed. The steel plant is going on. Several thousand people of the local community, they are working there, they are being trained, 
they are being educated, they are being employed, and so on. In fact, the residential English medium school, as Mr. Bhattacharya was telling, he had set up a DAV, it was DPS. This school became a tourist attraction today in Chhattisgarh. People who go for seeing the waterfalls, they also go and visit the school to find out how the school, this type of school can be run. That means, if we have to really take care of environment, take care of community, one thing is very, very required. That is your resources and your technology. I am coming to intentions later on. In our country, in iron ore mining in particular, this resources and technology is a problem because of extreme fragmentation of the iron ore mines. You will be surprised to know that in, 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 in Odisha, there are as high as 168 iron ore mines. In Karnataka, the number of mines is 154. In Goa, there are 336 iron ore mines. Of course, 93 were working when the mine closer came. And many of these mines are very, very small. They have resources of varying from 1 million to 2 million to 3 million. The size of the mines is 1 hectare, 1 and a half hectares, 2 hectares. Mine owners are non-professional. Somebody was a shopkeeper, somebody was a politician, somebody was a school teacher. At one time, they all acquired mines. How do we expect that these mine owners will have the resources, will have the inclination for technology to really develop the mines as scientific mines? And if you have got only about 2 million tons of resources, your first intention will be to pick up the resources as fast as possible and then to abandon the mines. That is exactly what has happened. Regarding intentions, let me tell you that it is not only a function of resources, it is not also a function of human noble, nobility of mind. It is a function of law, legal obligations, social compulsions, compulsions within the organization, as Mr. Patakiri was telling. And these things are not there in our country. I happened to look after a coal and iron ore mine in USA. I have seen that no permit will be granted there unless and until I file a bond and put either cash collateral or LC against a commitment that the moment I complete the mining operations in that particular per against the particular permit, I have to bring the situation back as normal as possible. That means the slope of the mines, which is hills, which is disturbed. I have to make the slope again as it was almost there and do the plantation over there. If I do not do it, if I do not do it, they will not only encash the bonds, take away my LCs, they will try to find out where I am working and where my group is working any, in any part of the United States. And they will catch hold of me and stop my operations. Therefore, reclamation is a perennial investment, perennial expenses for American mining sector, which of course is not there. That answers the question why for 10 to 12 years the environmental destruction was allowed and people remained silent and ultimately the Supreme Court had to intervene. But in our country, we really move like pendulums from one end to another. From 2002 onwards, Supreme Court has engaged a number of committees. Two main committees is Central Import Committee of 2002 and Justice M.B. Shaw Committee in 2010. The Environment and Forest Ministry has constituted two committees. One is Madhav Gadbil Committee in 2010 and then uh, Kosturi Rangan Committee, K. Kosturi Rangan Committee in 2012. And what has happened, all those committees and the recommendations together, they have come as a stick to punish the mining industry. The whole approach has been punitive. The result has been Goa mining operations, which I have seen myself. Goa mining, mining is carried out to a large extent in environmental methods. It is closed for the last two years.
Karnataka, 100 mines are non-operational. Odisha, the mining production has come down from 75 million tons, 74 to be precise, to 30 million tons. And this is how things are moving. In fact, if growth and environmental protection, these are to go together, then what is needed is correction, not possibly one-time action of stopping the operations altogether. I think it is time then which when we should do it. The ray of hope has been that the new MMDR Act which is being proposed, of course being proposed for the last five years, nothing has happened as yet, that contains some very interesting clauses. For your information, let me share those clauses with you. As against minimum size of a mine of four hectares, now, now, of course, many mines are one hectare or two hectare because there is a provision during the, for renewal that four hectare will not be considered. So, minimum size of four hectare has been increased to ten hectares. Maximum size of mines of hundred hectares has been, th sorry, thousand hectares has been decided to be ten thousand hectares. That means, with these laws coming, it is expected the mines should be large with adequate resources to invest in technology and long-term operations. They have also said that mines will be given to those through auction who have experience in carrying out scientific mining, not the shopkeepers and other people. Mines will be given to those who, have, who can bring in new technology. Mines will be given to those who can do value addition and infrastructural improvement. If these laws come in force, I believe some of the issues will be addressed. But what is more important is that a very comprehensive, regular monitoring. Fortunately, the new Act also speaks about it. They speaks of progressive mine closure, where every five years the mine situation will be reviewed and seen whether they are taking mine closure activity containing reclamation. At least there is some piece of paper which gives us good news. Let us see what the new government, what the new government does about it and to what extent the mining operations, especially in the iron ore sector, can be carried out as an environmental friendly manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shum. Uh, we are not able to take any question uh, because of the time problem. Uh, yeah. It is uh, our pleasure to... Yes, maybe. May we request Mr. Arun Mukherjee to please present the memento to Mr. Shum. And we have actually given, presented to Sir Mr. Bhattachari in the inaugural session. Yes, we are moving on to the next session. So we will quickly uh, change over for Dr. A. Nurag Danda and Dr. Suresh Rohila. Revival, regeneration, conservation. Master class on water, uh, and uh, this will be presented by Dr. Suresh Kumar Rahilla. Dr. Suresh Kumar Rahilla. Dr. Rahilla is associated as the program director with the Center for Science and Environment, famously known as CSE of New Delhi. 
a leading global think tank involved in promoting balanced environment and development. He holds doctoral degree from Queen's University, Belfast, North Ireland, and post-graduation degree from Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, and School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. He is a Fulbright Fellow associated with the University of California, Berkeley, and Sevening Scholar affiliated to University of Bradford. Uh, doc Dr. Rohila has to take the flight uh, in the evening, so uh, see if he will be completing in half an hour time. Thank you. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Bengal Chamber of Commerce to invite me to uh, give this talk to the August gathering. Uh, I have been asked to uh, talk about revival, regeneration and conservation, a master class uh, focusing on water. Uh, in particular, uh, I would be focusing uh, on you know, cities and urban water management issues, which is uh, something uh, which is across the country and it would not be specific to West Bengal and I hope that's not going to be a big issue because it's largely the uh, issue which I'm going to address and uh, this uh, talk of uh, half an hour would be based on the uh, three, three decades of experience of my institution and myself, two decades having been involved in water sector and we have been able to uh, influence the reform agenda in the country and we have set the tone of engaging with the government and NGOs and stakeholders. So I will start, up my, start my presentation and uh, I would like to show you some, uh, you know, uh, cover pages of the publication which Center for Science and Environment has been publishing. This is, one is Dying Wisdom which documents the history of traditional water harvesting across the country. Then the second book which actually raised the issue and said that uh, water should be everybody's business and not just uh, business of water supply and engineering boards and uh, government departments. And very recently we came out with a book which was an assessment of 71 cities water and wastewater scenario which actually set the tone of engagement because nobody else then, uh, you know, government actually can, thinks of uh, how the planning, designing for water and sanitation happens in the country. So this is the only document outside the government sphere of planning uh, how basically we challenge this whole issue of water and sanitation, we tried to set up a reform agenda. If we really see uh, in the last hundred years, the world population has tripled with the uh, human use of water which has increased six times and uh, the worldwide the consumption of water has been increasing. But does that mean that India is water stressed? What do you think? If I am also allowed to be, take class. Do you think India is water stressed? Yes, to what extent? Okay. But in terms of quantity, are we water stressed? Per, per capita water availability? Per capita, per person uh, in terms of vis-a-vis -vis the water available. I would say that there are some gross estimates in the country and in 1950s when we got independence we had around 6042 cubic meters per capita water availability which has slipped down to 1545 cubic meters per capita and we have actually slided down to the category of water stressed nation and uh, water stressed individuals. So this, is a, this itself is a sheer matter of concern for all of us. And we are now rated as a water stressed country and uh, this is the situation which emerges in the streets and in urban areas. If you have a look at this, this is a very common, if it is Kolkata, Delhi, Chennai, uh, this is a very common feature. If you see the wastewater, this is the scenario and these all pictures are from different cities across the country. But they all look the same. That what we take and what we give it back to the rivers, to the water bodies. And then coming to the condition of rivers and lakes. These are also pictures from different rivers and different lakes. So what is happening is we almost see that every city in the country is stressed. In summers there is a crisis. 
Now at many places it is also being talked about, like at least I know in Delhi and national capital region, the real estate developers are given only sewage to do construction. Similarly in Chennai the industry is being given sewage if they want permissions from environment department. There are stress to this extent, crisis to this extent, but on the other side when the rain comes there is flooding. And there is also a big question mark because of which ev every one of us has a water bottle in our hand which says that this water is safe but all other water which is there outside is unsafe. So there is a big question mark that is the water safe or not. So uh, in, in terms of broad picture what emerges and what we have today in front of our country is that though we may be asking for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council but we do not have a single city in the country which has 24-7 water supply. We cannot supply water to any city 24 hours in 7 days. There is a break in the service, somebody gets 4 hours, somebody gets 1 hour, somebody gets alternate day. On the other side, uh, Government of India did a survey out of the 432 top cities, not even a single city, including the capital city of India, could not come to the category of healthy and clean city. We may be talking about becoming San Francisco, London and you know, uh, Salt Lake City becoming, touching the heights and you know, Gurgaon becoming the millennium city. But not even a single city in the country met all the criteria in terms of water sustainability and environmental sustainability. And this information was provided by the cities themselves. It was not an independent survey. The government of India took the survey and urban local bodies provided this data. If you look at the gross data of what is happening in the developed world and in India, we see the developed world is largely, you know, the water is required for industry and domestic purposes. But same is not here in India. In India it's reverse. 70%, 80% water is for agriculture and irrigation purposes and very small quantities of water is for, at the moment, for industry and uh, domestic sector. And also this scenario is not going to change over a period of time. Not much. Because we also have a big number of people to support and we need to uh, produce food and also not uh, many big policy decisions are being done to touch the farming sector or irrig irrigation practices. But if the city and industries have to grow, what are the options left with us? Because if any government or any policy is done for touching that 70% of consumers, the governments are going to fall or politics is going to be coming in picture. So the big question is that what is the option left for cities and industries to grow? Very stringent environmental controls are coming. None of you are able to meet the criteria, then you are being asked to reduce your uh, you know, usage or you are being asked to use alternate sources or uh, you know, reuse uh, treated wastewater. So if Indian towns and cities have to become prosperous without more water, how is that possible? Do you think you have started thinking if we really have uh, to say that, you know, we are water stressed? I don't think many of us have started thinking. Because many of us even don't know the cost of the water which come to your house. Does anybody know what is the cost of full cost of the water which is supplied to your house? All of us are educated, many of us are engineers, many of us are doctors. Does anybody know? What is the cost of your water, what you get in your house, or cost? No, I'm just asking, is there, do you know that? Yeah, that's why so the, the whole, uh, the, the, the title of the talk which was given to me, if you don't know the value of the water, why will you think of reuse? Why, why will you think of protection? Why will you think of conservation? You know the value of gold, you keep it in locker. You, pres you preserve, you, you secure it. So today the point is, yes, there is only one city I have come across, city of Delhi on the water bill, the water gel board, the water and uh, sewerage board, it writes that for one KLD of water, it requires, it, uh, the cost is 30 rupees. For water and sewerage combined, the service cost is 30 rupees. And the starting slab for water charge is 2 rupees 10 paisa. And very recently the previous government fell down because the new government which came into power and at the moment though there is no power, government in power, they said that they will give free water and free electricity. So that 2 rupee 10 paisa out of the 30 rupees which was being also charged also could not be uh, you know, sustained. So 
The, there is a big question mark that how we are trying to address the water sector in, in the country. The conventional way is something if you have a look at this. When a small city becomes a big city or a village becomes a town, there is only one solution which is an engineering solution. You want to store, you want to divert, you want to pump, treat and you want to get water from far away place. Assuming that there is some clean source of water somewhere far away. You have polluted your lake, ponds and groundwater and whatever. In fact, there is no official place for groundwater as a source in the future of big cities. Largely that is the case. And for sewage, the, the conventional way how you say it is that I don't want a sewage treatment next to my house or next to my colony. You want further away outside your city. And this is an unwritten rule for any engineering practice you can see in the country. You would like to locate your water treatment plant next to the river, sewage treatment plant next to the river because if anything fails, then you can throw everything into the river. Because if uh, there is no electricity, untreated sewage go can go into the river and river will not shout, shout and scream. On the uh, matter of you know, bringing the water, I will give you some examples. Delhi is bringing its water from 250 kilometers away and it wants to go 500 kilometers. Chennai is bringing water from 100 kilometers away. Mumbai is bringing water from 100 kilometers away and this all is the story of store, pump, divert, pipe. Hyderabad is bringing water from 105 kilometers. In spite of that it has a Hussain Sagar dam in the center and it, can, uh, it has polluted that. Rajkot is bringing water from 75 kilometers away. Jaipur is 120 kilometers and the cost of 1088 crore. Jodhpur is 200 kilometers. And these kilometers mean everything because that means cost. And the formula which is used, if it is Jaisalmer or if it is uh, the, uh, the highest rainfall area in northeast, uh, the same formula is used that you will supply 150 liters per capita water to everybody. This is the technical norm based on which your designs are being done. But if you really have a look at the picture, do the cities actually uh, supply this? Because every city has shortage. You would say that every, no city has 24-7 water supply because they don't have water, that's why they are doing, or what is the picture? If you look at this uh, chart, just give some time to this. These are different colors, show the different size of the city. The blue color is the big city, metro city. Pink color is the class one city and the orange color is the third order city. And this cutoff line is that 150 liters and all the cities reported to us that how much per capita water they were supplying. The cities were supplying as high as 300, 400 or 5 liter, 500 liters per capita per day in place of technical norm which is 150, which means the cities are not water starved or not water stressed, they have enough water. But where is it going? And where are you lo losing that water? And why are you losing that water? I think we should think clearly about that. Interesting analysis we did of these 71 cities. The first three bars, first blue bar shows you the demand, pink color shows you the supply and uh, the yellow bar shows you the leakage loss. And the first three set of bars is the big cities, then medium cities, then small cities. If you see, the more the big the city was, the more losses it had in terms of leakage losses, as high as 35%. So the, your water utilities due to the choice of centralized water supply system because the distance which your water has to travel within the city. I am not even talking about transfer losses. They are losing as high as on average 35% of the water. And then nobody will pay for that water because the consumer even if you want to